All right. Uh, thank you, sir, for the introduction, and thank you to everybody who's participating. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is John Grady. I run a website called No BS Day Trading. I came up with it years and years ago. Um, seemed like the thing to be or the name to use at the time. <clears throat> anyway, um, what I try to do is discuss the uh, the basics of order flow and why order flow is important. And so I have a lot of videos on YouTube um, offering all kinds of information. I have all kinds of information on my website. So when I do these presentations, what I try to do is keep it streamlined to one particular topic as much as possible. And I try not to digress too much. I know people's attention span is about you know 25 to 30 minutes on average. Um, so I try to cram as much as I can into a you know, 25 to 30, 40 minute time period. And then we usually do a little bit of Q&A at the end. All right, <clears throat> so today, the, the main focus, I'm always trying to come up with, with new material. Um, after you do so many of these, it, it can become a little bit difficult. But today, what I'm gonna focus on is basically two things. Uh, one is the idea of good action versus bad action, all right? And I have some bullet points to keep me in line so I don't, uh, stray too far from the uh, topics. So when, when I say good action versus bad action, what I'm talking about is situations where the market seems to be more readable. And when I say readable, I mean actually conducive to making calls which have a better than random result, right? So you're, you're making calls that will ultimately yield a better than average, you know, um, or yield results better than a coin flip obviously, right, versus unreadable, which is when you're looking at a market and there just doesn't seem to be any information available, which allows you to make a better than random call, all right? And in my material, what I call that is a high probability, low risk situation, meaning we're trying to find good trades that are likely to work more than 50% of the time and, and we can structure them in such a way that the risk to reward ratio uh, is solid. So you're, you're maybe risking, you know, worst case, one to one. You're risking three or four ticks to make three or four ticks. Best case, maybe you're only risking two ticks to make six, eight, 10 ticks, something like that, right, with the way that the setup is. So high probability, low risk, high prob, low risk um, versus a 50 50 coin flip. That's what I mean when I say good action versus bad action. The second part of the equation today is um, something that a lot of people don't really do when they first start. People hear about journaling their trades or reviewing their trades or recording their trades, right? And you should do all of those things. You should record your trades, um, record the day session, review the actual recording, and then if you journal, you begin to make notes as to why you did what you did. <clears throat> and so Peter um, and the team at Jigsaw have developed a product called Journalytics. Uh, and he showed it to me a while back. Um, and I thought it was a really great product, as I think most of the jigsaw stuff is. And what it does is it allows a person to really easily and efficiently classify their trades and look at their results and um, develop your own little spreadsheet that's really easy to follow. And you can even take audio notes with it, right? So the idea today is that I'm going to walk you through the, the concept of readable versus unreadable action and different kinds of trades and then tell you how I would go about classifying those trades in a journal and then that would lead into tomorrow where Peter can talk about journalytics and then build upon what I'm talking about today which is hey if you were doing sort of what John was doing and you're classifying your trades this is how you can use journalytics to do it in, extremely, in an extremely efficient way. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, all right? And it should all lead together in a, in a very uh, cohesive manner, shall we say. So let's talk about readable versus unreadable action um, and developing a feel for your product. We're just going to jump right into uh, some, some trade stuff, okay? So when we're looking at trades or we're looking at the actual activity, all right, you're thinking about making a trade, what do you want to see? What you want to see is you want to see um, action which is maybe giving you clues 
as to the most likely direction. Now, how can that be? It can be because sometimes bigger players step up with a lot of size and they start pressing in one direction. It can be a situation where uh, there are potentially a lot of stop orders that can be set off, right? So when you hear about squeezes or stop order runs, um, what that's referring to is a, a spot where, let's say you know you have a very obvious technical support level and the whole world is watching that technical support level and the ES gets down towards that area, most likely if the ES trades below that price, let's say, by three, four, five, six ticks, you're gonna see maybe a lot of stop orders get set off, all right? And so the idea is to go with that, that trend and what you're doing is you're, you're trying to go with it. You hope the stop orders get set off and if they do, the market should move in your favor fairly quickly, all right? So let's look at two examples here from the get-go. One um, is you have some, some early morning action right off the open. You can see it's 9.29 a.m. Hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, Fernando, if you do have any problems, obviously just jump in and let me know in terms of video or audio. Um, but on the right-hand side, this is the ES depth of market. And over here, these are treasury markets, which I also trade. Uh, we have the 10-year, five-year, excuse me, 10-year, 30-year, five-year, and the Ultra Bond. There are also some other ones. The two-year is a heavily traded product, but these are the four that I watch, along with the ES, uh, you know, E-mini S&P 500 futures. So a lot of people have the idea that right off the open, they should be involved in the S&P. Um, some people not so much, but this is kind of a common thread, and people say you want to be there for the open, which you do. You want to be there for the opening action because a lot of volume typically does hit the market during that time period. However, you want to be able to see something or have some idea about potential direction, okay? So if we're looking at a day like this, what I want, I'm going to scan through a little bit, but what I want you to watch is as, as the market opens right here, you're going to see that a wave of activity trades you see a little bit of a jump there and there might be a little bit of a lag on your screen and I'll pause and walk through it with you um, but right off the open the market's trading like 15 15 50 a little bit few buy orders hit knock it up to 18 right and then on this particular day and this was just a week ago I think I was trying to get some you know current footage it trades up around this 18 18 25 level and you can see these are the overnight highs at 1975 up here. And what happens is the ES trades up and then it ends up falling back in. So this is right at 930 in your first minute to two minute opening. Okay. One of the problems most traders have is they want to be involved all the time and they're constantly looking for a reason to take a trade. And you'll hear this from most professionals and most, um, performance coaches slash psychologists in the field, you should really be looking for reasons to not take the trade rather than reasons to take the trade. So good trades typically present themselves in a very uh, obvious and overt fashion. And something that I'm going to talk about in a little bit is if the trade is, is easy, it's probably a good trade. And if you have to think about it for too long, it's probably not a good trade. So what happens here is you'll see um, the market kind of trades around this area like so, right? And it's just hovering. So what you see right off the bat is in the first five minutes, 934, 935 is where we are, <clears throat> all the market's done is jump from 1550 to 18 back to 1550 in that first five minutes of trading in the S&P. Now, there are other days when that's not what the opening activity is, right? The opening activity might be right from the start, S&P starts making new highs or new lows, you know, overnight highs, overnight lows. And there's this wave of momentum that goes along with that. And so if anybody was watching this morning at 8.30, we had uh, durable goods and the PPI at 8.30 a.m. And even though that's before the S&P is open, the S&P responds and the Treasuries uh, responded in a pretty big way. They had a huge rally off at the 8.30 number today, all right? So when there are number releases and there's some volume and it's not too choppy, 
these trends can build, and that's why you want to be in front of your screen during that time period at 8.30 when those numbers are coming out. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but that is true, and you try to take advantage of it. But if you're sitting there at 9.30 and what you see, let's say, for example, is this, and you have an S&P that's just kind of going back and forth, right, in the same area, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, right? So in the first 20 minutes now, it finally goes from 15 down to 11.50. And, you know, then it comes back to 15 again, okay? So this is a problem in your first 30 minutes of trading. You don't have really any clearly defined direction or any pressure or any momentum. They're not hammering overnight highs or lows. And so a lot of people are under the impression that they should be able to find trades in that activity. And the truth of the matter is in a situation like that, unless you're trying to be one of the players which is playing in the range and you're also okay with some risk on the downside, it ends up being a spot where there's not a lot to do, obviously not in terms of directional trading. Um, so the activity is not that great, and it's not, in, in my opinion, it's not conducive to finding these high problem, low risk reads. Now, if we go to a different day, same thing. <clears throat> what happened on this day is right off the open, <clears throat> the market drops. I fast forwarded a little bit to try to condense this presentation, but the market basically had opened about 94, 9450. And it immediately dropped in to like 90, 91. And it stayed below that 94, 93 area for the first 15 minutes here. And essentially what happened is over this time period, there's just a sense of weakness. Like even there, you see how easily it falls in from 90 all the way down to 86, 87, 87 right now. And so the immediate um, read, if you're watching the order flow, is that there appears to be some weakness in this market. So the possibility of this market cracking through overnight lows is let's just say based on my experience, more likely in this situation than it was in the previous situation, okay? And so when we talk about developing a feel for the product, this is another big part of the equation. You need to pick a product or two or three products and you just watch those products. So when people talk about these you know, systems or, or yeah, systems for lack of a better word, that's just what they call them, for trading any product anytime anywhere it's a ridiculous concept okay yeah watching the order book is should be an integral part of any trading methodology but the way that you trade certain products has to be different because products move in a much different fashion and you're going to see this when I'm making a trade in the in the treasuries I'm aware of how much size has to trade in order for me to get paid um, so I know it's going to move differently than the ES moves and I know both of those products would move differently than, let's say, gold or crude oil would move, all right? And, and those products are going to move differently than the, the way the bund and the bobble move. So the idea is still the same in terms of order flow and size, uh, stop orders, HFT, market makers, all that good stuff. But you have to adapt to the, each particular product. So if you watch the same product day in and day out and you just watch the depth of market, you begin to develop a feel for the product. And so this was a situation where I thought it was different and I make losing trades too, you know, don't misunderstand me, but um, the losing trades are usually cut pretty quickly <clears throat> because I have an idea of what I want to see. And that's something that you should have too. Before you ever enter a trade, you should have an idea of exactly what you should be seeing. And if you don't see what you expect to be seeing, you probably need to get out of the trade. And that comes with some experience. But what happens here on this day is the market drops from 94 all the way down to the lows, basically. It does bounce off the lows. So that's just that's the initial bounce, and that's enough often to shake out some short trades in here. But what you'll notice is it doesn't bounce past this point. So rather than like with the previous example, it goes from 18 or it goes from 15 to 18 to the high side, then back to 15, and then down to 11, and then back to 15, and then back to 17 where it's hanging in this range, what you have on this day is a market that goes from 94 down to 90, kind of hangs, goes from 90 down to 86, 
bounces, now it hangs around 88, 88, 50, and essentially just stays lower below the opening and, and it's dropping and it can't bounce, right? It can't bounce. Now, of course, guys look at charts and they can talk about the way that they would look at that on a chart or a one minute chart. I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but it's way easier to see in the order book and you can also see the volume that's trading. And so in this scenario, I was anticipating basically a breakthrough lows. I figured that there would be a breakthrough lows and ideally there'll be some stop orders triggered below the, the overnight low which is at 85.25. Um, but it's not super, super fast, so it's not crazy. Uh, there it is. So I wanted to fast forward. So you see, again, it had a little bit of a bounce to 88, 87, 88, but it's still it struggled to get past 88. I ended up taking a trade here at 86. <clears throat> and that, so just FYI, that means I'm short. Um, and the idea is very simple it breaks lows, right? And as it breaks lows, what I do is I'll bring a trailing stop down to make sure that first I'm at a break even, worst case, because sometimes the market will break lows and instantly shoot, shoot right back up. And when that happens, usually it's enough to put the stall on the breakout for a while and the market ends up getting very, very choppy. So that's why you see a stop move to, to break even. And a lot of people think that's crazy and they think that it's too tight. And it depends on the situation but it's just a, a philosophy that I like to use in these situations. And so something else that you can't see in the chart that you can see in the order book is you can see size. So it's not a huge order, but you see right here, there's an order of 533 contracts. What your average newer trader doesn't understand, and they don't ever see this because they never look at the order book, is that in order for the market to move lower, you have to see 533 more contracts trade at the bid. Sellers have to actively hit that bid with a market order in order for the market to move lower, right? So I can see that happening in the moment as an order flow trader and your chart trader is watching the chart go up and down and they're not seeing the volume trade. So what you'll see here is sell orders do go for the 85s. And as they do, you're going to see that's going to create the wave right there. They start going a little bit lower. Some more orders hit 84.75, right? 84.50. And I start bringing my stop down to make sure that I lock in at least a little bit of profit on this trade. Now, trade management is a whole different sample altogether, a whole, whole different beast altogether. Um, and kind of goes beyond the scope of the webinar. But the idea is that I'm just playing momentum. And more importantly, that the activity is conducive to trying to find a high prob low risk situation um, and is conducive to you know reads that should be better than random given a long enough time period all right and so what happens here is because of the context i i think the market might bounce back <clears throat> towards the, the break point eventually um the action wasn't that fast, and so when it's not real fast, you don't typically get sweeps of 16 or 20, 25 ticks in the ES. You might get something like this for eight, 12 ticks, and then it starts to kind of bounce around again. So for me, I saw a potential backing up. I end up exiting at 83.75, which isn't a huge winner, but it's a win. Um, and then the thing is, I know I can get back in. If I want to get back in, I may go the other way, whatever. But the short of it is that the market ends up bouncing there, um, like so, and it ends up going all the way back to my entry price of 86. And so, and that's not any, you can see it's the same time frame. I didn't jump forward. <clears throat> so that was as far as it went. Uh, if I'm being honest, I was a little bit lucky in terms of the catching almost the exact bottom on my exit. Um, I'm usually a little early and I get out maybe four or five ticks too soon. But the, the concept made sense. So it bounces back up. And that was the trade. So let's say if I was classifying that trade, I would classify that trade as a breakout trade in the ES, right? And then I would look at the time frame that I was in the trade, and I would look at the recording, and I would see how fast everything took place, right? And that's how I would look at it. So let's jump forward a little bit more. Uh, it actually rallied beyond 86 and, and back up to 90s. 
Um, <clears throat> so this is a trade. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I got the right uh, the right situation here. Excuse me one second. Got to look at this. I put some video together and didn't have it quite where I wanted it. Here we go. All right, so another misconception about scalping is that this, this idea that scalpers are always going for like a one tick win. And I have to work with my students on this repeatedly to try to, to, to get their brain to think a different way. Sometimes there are good situations, particularly in treasuries, where you can go back and forth and grab one tick, uh, you know, winning trades. And that's the right trade. Or sometimes I'm in a trade and I think I'm going to get three or four out of it and I can just see it's not really going. And so I just take the one tick. Um, but there's often a, a common misconception that you get in a trade, you try to make the one tick, you get out, you do it again, you do it again, you do it again. And that there's some kind of time frame that you have to adhere to in terms of how long you hold the trade. And now sometimes being in a trade for too long is a bad idea, but sometimes depending on the context, you do have to hold the trade for a while. So this is a perfect example of that. This was a situation, if you look at it, it's 11 a.m. Uh, the treasuries had been pretty slow. And in a nutshell, I thought they were going to bottom out somewhere around here. And I end up taking a long trade at seven half. Um, I know going into this trade, and what I'm, where I'm going with this is if I was classifying it, again, as a trade type in, in a journal, what I'm taking here would be a fade trade because obviously I'm buying at the lows or near the lows. So the market had traded lower between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. So I'm classifying this as a fade trade at the low at 11 a.m., and then I'm going to see how long I have to sit in the trade. But I know going into it, I might have to sit in it for 20, 30, 40 minutes to actually make some money on this trade. But if I'm right about the bottom, it's worthwhile because I might be able to get four, five, seven, even eight ticks out of a trade like this. It just depends on the situation. So entry at 11.10 a.m., I'm going to scan through. It, it moves around quite a bit, but it takes a while for this to play out. Eventually, it moves in my favor. You know, 15 minutes later, finally, starts moving in my favor. Um, fortunately, it didn't go against me. I never had to take any heat on the trade. And it starts to move up. And right in here, I end up deciding to take the trade off. Right there, I'll show you. For five ticks, and it's 40 minutes later. Now, the reason that I'm showing that and the reason that I'm scanning through it, obviously, is for time frame today. But the reason that I'm showing this is I think a lot of people are under the impression that, again, if you're a scalper, you're in there and you're trying to bang out that one or two, those one or two ticks, and hopefully in you know three or four minutes, which is true. Those trades are the trades that everyone likes to have. But there are also situations when I might sit in a trade for 40 minutes or 45 minutes or even an hour if the conditions are right, okay? So in a situation like that, I'm basically scalping five ticks. Right there, I ended up getting filled at 10 over the course of 40 minutes. But if I jump ahead, I can show you a quick other trade, kind of like the S&P trade right here, where now it's 8.38 a.m., and the market starts trading lower, pretty much right from the get-go on this day uh, in the treasuries. And I end up taking a sell-side trade at six half here in the 10-year. Right there, I get the fill, six half. That's the emergency stop, by the way, just in case a news event uh, comes in, you know, somebody releases some crazy news in the market rallies against me. I have a, an emergency market stop order in there that'll be filled somewhere. At least I'll know I'll be out and I won't be in a 40 tick loss. Um, and so I enter that trade at 839 AM, right? And the conditions seem to be such that there's good activity and it's readable and there ideally will be some 
pressure to the downside. And it takes a few minutes to play out, but not that long. And what ends up happening is it trades lower and lower again. Sorry, let me back up a little bit. They end up taking out a couple bids and the market pauses and it pauses near a technical support area, which I figure will probably be some support down here around three, half, four. And I end up working a bid actually right there at four, trying to cover. And I realize they may not even hit fours. And at this point, I'm okay with taking the four tick scalp in five minutes. All right. So again, if we're thinking about classifying our trades and how, how I would look at that trade, I would classify that as an early morning, eight, you know, 8.39 a.m., uh, breakout trade, good activity, happens quickly, I'm in the trade for five minutes, what's the result, right? And so I'm going through this with you so that whenever you start looking at your own trades, these are the kind of things that you want to contemplate and again, you can use, you know, like journalytics as a way to even immediately record an audio uh, review of your own trade right away. You can boost it up right here, or I could boost it up right here and say, took a trade at six half, um, covered at four half, you know, covered at four half because it was technical support. There, I got my fill. Uh, looked like a breakout trade early morning in the trade for five minutes. Good activity, you know, and just make a note and go on down the road from there. And so that's that. Now, if we fast forward again, I'm going to show you bad activity. This is a day where this high volume had traded here in the treasuries. And you can see a lot of volume right in here between seven and, and five half. And I know this going into the day that it's slow. There's no news at 830, which is going to give us a heads up or not. It's going to do something like today, for example. So if you look at a chart of today or the action today in treasuries at 8.30 versus a day like this, you're gonna notice a substantial difference. So the market is 8.31, it's trading six, it trades five half, trades six, goes down a little bit, right? Goes down to five, five half, four half, then it comes back up, this is a long time. This is what I'm trying to emphasize to you. So this is over the course of now an hour, right? So over the course of an hour, treasury is basically trade from six to four half back to six. So in a spot like this, the reality is that a breakout situation is pretty unlikely, but it can be dangerous both ways because a fade trade can be dangerous here too. You try to take a fade trade at let's say seven or seven half, you're liable to get run over the nine half and then it comes back uh, but I do take a breakout trade thinking I can get a look and right there I end up buying sevens at uh, 9 32 a.m. and this is really in my opinion where one of the true strengths of scalping lies and that is in the ability to adapt in the moment and so what you have to understand is that all the programs and the HFTs and the algos and the market makers are responding in the moment all day long. Yes, they might have to work some fundamental trades based on whatever their risk is. Um, and they might have to work some size at certain prices, but they still have programs which are working smaller size based on what's going on in the moment. And so this is a situation where the market actually moves in my favor by a tick. And I'm looking to get more out of it. And it just isn't there to be had, essentially. And so the market ends up falling back in. Right there, I'm trying to get filled for a one tick winner. And I'm 56 in the queue. You probably can't see that, but that's what the, that's the position in the queue. And I still, I'm only 56 in the queue in a 10 year and I can't get my fill, which means not even 60 contracts are printing up into seven half. And then it trades back into sevens. And so I go for the scratch, which I get. Not too many people trade like that. 
Um, but this is what they do in prop shops. It's what's been the history of floor trading. You know, guys kind of get in there and they're always working for situations where they can minimize their risk or they're reacting in the moment. So for example, and back in the day, guy on the floor is maybe working a trade, does the same thing. He buys sevens and then he turns around and he's kind of offering maybe, you know, eight or eight half and the market moves up a tick and you see some other guys bidding and some other guys offering and then he can just see the bigger players aren't stepping up for whatever reason they're not buying seven and a half and buying eight and buying eight half they're only still bidding at seven where he is so he turns around and he ends up hitting one of their bids for seven and he scratches his trade and he waits for the next trade all right so looking at this if you were classifying it breakout trade to the upside, but breakout trade in slower action, um, very thick volume, market doesn't move, goes one tick in the favor, I mean it does print two ticks, but then falls back to the entry price, I take the trade of the scratch, and you can make all kinds of notes around that, all right, so the action itself really wasn't very good for trading anyway, um, I thought I might be able to have to look like I did, I didn't make any money on it, um, but you'll see even here, and it actually went back up seven, seven half. They trade eight. They come back to seven again, come back to six half. And so essentially, you know, at 8.30, between 8.30 a.m. and 10 a.m., an hour and a half has elapsed, all right? And the 10-year is still trading six. Now, yes, it went to four half, and yes, it went to eight. But an hour and a half later, it's back at six again. So that's bad action overall in terms of of what you want to see when you're making high prop trades um and at that point it's usually that that kind of day i just turn the screen off and i don't trade anymore um because it just it's just too difficult you know and the other part of that is if you get on the wrong side of a trade on a day like this you usually don't get your money back right so if I, if it's risking your money on a day when the opportunity might be there to make six seven eight ten to twelve trades that's fine, but if you're sitting there and you're going to make one trade and get run over and then you won't see another opportunity, maybe all day long, it's not really justified, all right? So the last little thing that I wanted to show you, um, sometimes the action is not just about the action being too slow. Sometimes it's about the action being too fast, and I was able to find this. I pulled this up from one of my videos. This was when the markets were going haywire after that meltdown uh, last year. And uh, you can see the liquidity in the ES. I mean, you have like 10, 18, 1, 31, 24, 20. Much different. You do have a big offer here of 1,000, which I'm going to talk about uh, in just a minute. But there can be days when the liquidity is too thin or after a news event comes out, it's too thin. And it can be almost impossible to read. And if you want to trade that, you really have to have a lot of experience with it and you have to understand the risk involved with it, okay? Um, and most newer traders should not trade in that environment. It can look great and it can be the kind of situation where the one lot and two lot guys have $5,000 days, you know, but what they then come to realize is when that action, either A, they give it all back plus more because they didn't really know what they were doing, they were just lucky. Or B, when it slows down, they realize that that only happens once every three years. And so if they want to actually make a living at this, they have to learn how to trade in different uh, situations. But um, something I wanted to talk about to kind of wrap this up and go to Q&A is, during the last Jigsaw presentation, a guy asked the question, which is, what's the difference between looking at this and looking at a one-minute chart? And this is a perfect example. The guy looking at a one-minute chart can't see that offer for a 1,000 contracts. And that's not always critical. It's not always heavily influential on the movement, but it can be. And so I can see the 1,000, and you can believe that all of the HFT programs in the world are looking at that thousand and the idea that the thousand goes away or either gets hit or cancels the market will probably pop through there by at least a few ticks 
And so I can see that I didn't take a trade, but I'm saying in other situations, I can also use that information. The one tick chart trader can't see that ever. Or excuse me, the one minute chart trader, right? So what I always tell people is there are things, anything that you can see on a chart, I can see in a depth of market, but I can see things in the depth of market that you cannot see on the chart. And this is a perfect example. And the buy side does end up clearing out that thousand. Um, we won't go into why that's even there on a day like that day, but it was. And you'll see how they jump through and it did trade. So the instant it trades through 42.50, it snaps up to 44, right? Um, and, it, and you immediately would have guys working sell side orders to cover based on that. But it bounces around right there for a second and then shoots higher, like right there. That kind of activity is something that newer traders want to avoid. You, you typically will get demolished if you try to become involved in something like that. Um, but anyway, it provides another example of if you're classifying trades and you are involved, you have to make a note, okay, I had that, that day where I made 2,000 on a one lot in the S&P or lost 2,000 on a one lot in the S&P. What happened? Oh, that was the day where the markets were in chaos mode and I was taking shots and the liquidity you know, was five by five in the ES. And so you have to take all those things and put them into your um, classification. And so at the end of it, what you do is you break it down and you start looking at your time in the trade, time of day of the trade, what market you're trading, what was the scenario, blah, blah, blah. And you figure out your strengths and your weaknesses. So a lot of people, to finish off with these two ideas, a lot of people had this idea and too many people have preached this idea over the years in the books and the, the seminars of, well, it's just about risk to reward. You know, if, if you're, if you're getting a four to one, you know, reward to risk, all you have to do is be right 25% of the time, or let's say 30% of the time, and you'll make money. That is such a nonsensical statement. It is absolutely ridiculous. The number of people who go out there and try that, and then have you know 15 losing trades in a row is enormous, and that's what happens. You still have to have a methodology that l makes you right, you know, one out of four times if you're employing that risk reward scenario, um, and you have to have it has to be based on something other than just blind probabilities and statistics. Guys who study the bell curve are always encountering that. They they go through standard deviations and the bell curve and the idea that the markets always have to come back and they don't and they can do well uh, during tight range phases and they can get obliterated during one way streets. So the reason all this is important is because um, of this paragraph right here, which is that people can often look at a journal and they break down their trades and they can maybe see, Hey, I do, I'm best at trades between, uh, 9.45 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. in the E-mini S&P and on days when the activity is fast. But yet, they'll still go and trade the S&P at 1 p.m. looking for some long-term turnaround trade where they think they've called the reversal and they didn't, you know, and they put in a three, four-point stop and they lose back everything they made prior. Or a person might think that I'm good at trading the 10-year uh, the and the treasuries, and my best trades usually last about eight to 10 minutes. Um, but today, I'm gonna go trade the ultra bond, which is way more volatile. And then they get worked in the ultra bond and they give away eight, 10 takes in the ultra bond and it took them three days to make that 10 takes in the, in the treasuries, you know, on size. Um, and that's of course about discipline. But it's also about, do you really have a method that seems to be offering a consistent profit that's not just random. And so that's where you use reviews and journaling to help you identify your strengths and weaknesses. And then you try to eliminate the bad trades, you know, and just go with what works. And so some people may trade all week and the way that they make money is they make one trade a day or maybe two trades a day, or maybe they have two days where they make no trades and other people, are better at maybe making eight, 10 trades a day, depends on the product, 
um, and kind of going both ways and playing both sides, but they know what they're doing. It works for them. So for them to try to go down to making one trade a day, it wouldn't suit their methodology or their style and vice versa. Um, so doing all this can help you figure out what works for you and then you take it from there. All right, Fernando, that was about 10 minutes longer than I had anticipated. So if you want to do some q and I'm open to it. Great presentation, great presentation. So you. you can see the Q&A or do you want me to, to read the uh, questions to you? I think I can see it. Um, there are some in Q&A yeah, yeah. and some on the chat. Open, yes, yeah, so the chat's got a ton more. Let me open that up real fast. Um, let me go, let me do Q&A. Mm -hmm. That's um, like the chat stuff is flying by. So these are all, let's see, so the, the really fast day, I just a quick question, somebody was asking about the dates of these, which I'm happy to answer. The really fast action, this was from last February, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but these trades that I was showing you, these are all from the last month. Uh, so the S&P trades, actually the S&P trade was just last week. Um, the action was from last week. And the, the um, treasury trades were two or three weeks ago. Um, and it's just because I'm trying to find, like I always try to find something that's very clear in terms of uh, conveying the, the concept. So I, I don't know that I can get through all of the, the chat stuff, but let me, um, let me try. What's your opinion on long-term trading? I, I think long-term trading this is my opinion for what it's worth. And like I caught some flack over this. I did it. Let me also throw this out there because some of you may have listened to the chat with traders podcast. This is my chance to publicly say something. There's a part, part in this chat with traders podcast where he asked me about swing trading or he basically says, do you think that people using order flow, like would it help guys who are swing traders? And I said, no, I don't think that it would. Um, I'm not a fan of swing trading and I don't really know people who do well swing trading. And then, you know, a few people picked that one part of the podcast to focus on, obviously. Um, it's not that nobody makes money, let's say swing trading. I just think it's way more difficult and a bit more random and, and for the reasons I'm explaining, because your HFTs and your algorithms are responding second to second. So for a person to try to tell me where they know where Apple's stock's going to be in two days is pretty ridiculous to me. You know, it's like I, the idea behind that seems, as I don't think they understand exactly what's driving the market, but if it works for them, that's great. If you're going to be a longer term trader, I would say you need to study the fundamentals really, really well. So yeah, if you, you know, if you have the ability like a fund does to go and check out, um, where you think cattle prices will be in two months and you want to make a bet based on that or whatever, then that's fine. Um, I just, I'm not a fan. Um, a couple of things. Some of this I can't, I won't be able to get all of this today. Um, all right, let me try to. This is a good one. Sometimes I'm first in the queue, but 50 trades get processed before me. Um, the reason for that is because the market makers get priority in the queue. So because they provide liquidity, they get the better fills or they have a hidden order that you can't see. And so when those, you might be the very number, you might be number one in the queue and you might see 500 trade in front of you before you get your fill. And that's why there are hidden orders that are sitting there. And because they're market makers, they get priority. So people should be aware of that. Um, why choose the you the third year over the ultra bond? Uh, it's it's because there's a long story behind that. But if it, if the ultra bond works for you, that's great. Most people get obliterated in it because they don't know how to handle the volatility. You know, so most people are better off starting in the ten year or the third year, and then if they do well, maybe going to the ultra bond. Um, There's some trades about trade management. Honestly, guys, I can't go into that today. That takes too much information or like too long to explain. Um, what are your thoughts on single tick scalping? I covered that. You don't want to do it too often. 
you can come fall into the pattern of making one and losing three. Um, how do you define, this is good, how do you define today's action in the 10 year? So great off the 830 number, right, one way, and then it fell into a very, very tight range, thick range, and just stopped. Um, and I was looking at that and thinking about talking about it. So it, it went from being readable to being unreadable, you know, is what happened. And then it goes sideways. Um, so when you realize that it's going sideways and nothing's happening, you just have to stay out of it. What economic calendar are you using there? That's the Econo Day calendar. Some people have their own, you know, ideas. It's not a, you know, a pitch for Econo Day. It just, it's what I use because Econo Day um, announces the treasury auctions, which take place. So that's always helpful as well as speakers. Some people like um, FX Street, Forex Factory. Um, Jigsaw actually tied a news thing into its. Um, yeah, Journalytics has a great. Uh, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great so you can news. use Journalytics for mm -hmm. news now. Um, so you guys should look into to adding the treasury announcements to that as well. Yeah. Um, what do you think about market making scalping styles? It works for the people who use them. They're usually heavily capitalized. Some of what I try to do, obviously, is I'm not making a market because I'm not trading enough size for that, but I look at the way that they trade and try to mimic it during certain time periods if I think they're going to affect the uh, market in a, in a big way. Um, how do the orders of seven or 8,000 fit into the good action, bad action idea? You know, that's uh, <clears throat> dependent upon context. Sometimes if they trade six, 7,000, that's fine. Like the one trade you saw where um, I end up shorting. Was it here? It wasn't here. Back here, somewhere. Yeah, right here. I mean, there's, there's going to be a few thousand on the way down, but that's to be expected with the context. Other days, if it's seven or 8,000, it's too much and it's not moving and, and you have to bow out. Any tips on trading the ES when it changes so quickly? Yeah, this is a question I always get. Um, you can't look at the ES in terms of it's going from, from 200 to 150 to 125 to 212 to 87, right? That, that's not going to work. With the ES, it's a different beast, and you have to view it from a, a little bit bigger standpoint in terms of what are the cash markets doing. You know, what's cash S&P, cash Dow, cash NASDAQ doing? How do, the, how do the futures normally react? And then you're trying to call it within the realm, right? So that's one of the reasons why I trade treasuries, and I talk to people about this, is it's possible at times, if your read is right, obviously, to pick the entry price perfectly in treasuries uh, without ever taking one tick of heat, like you saw in those two trades. Um, and that's pretty much impossible on the ES. Not always. You might catch a good break and it, you never take any heat, but usually it's going to bounce around at least a two or three tick range um, around your entry price. Same thing with the exit. So you have to look at it from a little bigger, like back away from the, the screen a little bit, bit farther, you know, and get a bigger picture on it. Um, uh, is morning session usually better than afternoon? Typically it is. Typically. I mean, the ES obviously can have huge moves in the afternoon. Um, treasuries can as well. Sometimes not huge moves, but they can move. But usually if you can't make money in the, in the mornings, you can't make it in the afternoons for most people. Um, questions about setups that really goes too far today. Uh, I can't really talk about different setups. You typically use volume stops in both the treasuries and the equities, not usually, mostly just treasuries. Again, because the equities are, um, they change a lot faster. So typically I just use a straight up market or I'll, I'll use a stop limit order, what I usually use, um, at least for, for like entries because sometimes the slippage on the ES can be pretty big. So you might actually not get your fill for four or five ticks away from where you want it unless you use a stop. If you use a stop limit, you avoid that. Okay, so uh, in regards to times, when you were trading at 8.30, is that the 8.30 Central or 8.30 Eastern? That's 8.30 Eastern time. So it's 7.30 Central. 
that's when all those big reports are released, like today. You have durable goods, you'll have GDP, you'll have CPI, you'll have the non-farm payrolls, the employment situation. Um, all those big numbers are usually released at 8.30, then you have a few that are at 10 a.m., like consumer sentiment sometimes. So you, you always want to try to be there for those numbers if you can. Can you use order flow without looking at technical support and resistance? You absolutely can. Often you see the support and resistance develop in the order flow, but I do pay attention to you know the previous couple of days uh, and if there are any major huge levels that everybody's watching, like right now people are watching um, something like the big bounce point in the S&P um, uh, from a resistance side, you know. Will this be recorded, Fernando? Are you guys going to post this on your site eventually? Uh, I guess it is being recorded, so I guess we will okay. post on our blog. All right, cool. Um, yeah, just send out a link. I'll I'll post mm -hmm. it like on Twitter too, whenever it's available. It it should be on the Jigsaw site at some mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Um, these are all the original chats. Here's one. I was falling. I was falling asleep waiting on treasuries, but I'm trying to give them a swing. For what it's worth, I get that question a lot, particularly from new people. I know they can look very slow, but the last like couple of weeks, it's not. What happens is they go through fast and slow periods. So if you're trading, then you have to be aware of when they're likely to get busy or just be sitting there watching. But the advantage is from a risk to reward standpoint. As I said earlier, you can often pinpoint entries and exits really, really well. I mean, if you know what you're doing, you know what I mean? Um, whereas the ES, or even if you go more thin, like gold and crude, you're, you're really bouncing around in, a, in an area because it's so illiquid. So you don't typically find the risk-to-reward situation that you can find in treasuries. But yeah, it requires a lot of patience. Um... Okay, here's a fair question. What you're doing right now is a market replay. It's like watching a movie and rewind. Why aren't you trading live right now? I'm not trading live right now because nothing's moving right now. And I do run live rooms. You know, you can look into that on my website. Um, and I agree, and I've shown losing trades on these presentations as well. When I try to pick out footage for these types of presentations, I try to pick out footage that exemplifies the concepts themselves, okay? And so this is why, why I showed the break-even trade, because I was trying to show how I might take a trade, but the action is not that great, and so I take it, it doesn't work, it comes back, it breaks even. And yeah, sometimes I step in front of a trade, and like the market might be moving lower, and this trade right here, the very first one. Um, I buy the seven halves. There are times when I buy seven halves and it goes through me and I take the two tick loss. And I freely admit that, you know, that's not a, an issue. And people who take my live courses see wins, losses, and scratches. Um, it depends on the topic and it depends on what I'm trying to convey this particular day. And so the main focus of this day is on how to find good versus bad action and to classify certain trade types. Um, and that's what I was trying to pick the best samples to illustrate. Uh, but the problem with, okay, hey, why don't you just trade live now is because it, it might be bad action right now. You know what I mean? And also, if, it, if it's 8.30 a.m. and the numbers are released, you know, and it's a presentation like this, I can't stop and talk um, in the moment and answer questions about this kind of stuff when the market might be moving seven, eight, nine ticks in a matter of, you know, two or three minutes. But so it's more, it's not about cherry picking trades in terms of winning trades. It's about cherry picking examples to try to illustrate certain ideas, whether, and I, in my other material I have in my course material, I show losses and I show how I handle them and I show trade management. You know what I mean? So I hope if you're watching, like you understand that I don't claim to have hundred percent winners. I definitely do not. Um, I, I try to do is, is show things that I think will help people build a better method and understand the markets better 
and understand what's happening in the same way that a chess, uh, a good chess player would try to teach opening strategy. You know, if you sit down to play chess and you, you move your rook, your first move, you're going to lose the game, guaranteed. So a good chess player, and that's for me, it's like, okay, if you're looking at a head and shoulders pattern on a chart and that's going to be how you make your trades, I'm going to tell you you're going to lose. So I try to steer you into a different direction and show you the order book and why it's important and explain the dynamics and then give the best samples that I can. And from there, it's still on you to research that more, to, to watch the depth of market more and see if you can't see some of the things that I talk about in my, in my material and on my website and in my videos. All right. So no problems there. I get it. Um, what do you think about spread trading without stops? It's a terrible idea. You'll eventually get destroyed. And many people did in 2008. That's exactly what they were doing. They were spreading cash against futures and they got annihilated. Can you please elaborate on the risk ratio? Why is it nonsense? It's not that risk to reward is nonsense. It's the idea that you say, okay, I'm gonna trade, I'll tell you exactly why. A guy came to me a while back and he had been taking this ES course and the pitch, the main pitch of the ES course was, you know, you risk four points to make 10 points, right? So two and a half to one, I think is what it was, right? So you risk four points, you're trying to make 10 points in the ES. Um, therefore, you only have to be right, whatever, 30% of the time, and you're going to make money. And that was the whole pitch. And then, of course, there was some technical analysis thrown in there with it. And the guy's like, okay, so he takes the course, and then he gets out of the course, and then he follows the course instructions to a T, and he has 10 losing trades in a row. All right, he's down 40 full points, 120 ticks in the ES. You can't just base it on risk to reward. Like you have to have some other element there, some other edge of your own in your method, which helps you identify better scenarios and better situations. So it's not sure. Obviously, I mean, I'm trying to risk risk one to make three is great, and that's what I try to do all the time. Um, but I also have other factors driving my decision making process besides just a risk to reward. And my two week session coming up, my webinar coming up, do you cover crude? I do not. I do not trade crude. It's too thin for me. I've had some some students who already traded crude and then took my class and then went on to continue trading crude. Um, but I find for most people it's very difficult and they struggle with it because it's so illiquid. And I can also teach the concepts easier in a more liquid marketplace. So no, I won't be trading crude oil. The uh, question is, how do we start to identify setups or uh, trade criteria in a new market? That's kind of a long answer, but basically, like I said, using the, the journalytics and the journaling process and the review process and recording your own trades, um, after a while, you start to see what seems to be working and what's not. Do you ever scale out of trades? Uh, sometimes, depends on the situation. Again, that goes beyond today's context. Same thing, there's some questions about specifics like like trade, like breakouts or fade trades or whatever. Again, that's kind of beyond today's, the scope of today's topic. And your experience is the ES or the treasuries an easier read. In my experience, overall, treasuries tend to be an easier read uh, when they're moving. But, you know, again, it depends on people's personal preference and just the context and the situation. I do make a lot of converts um, to treasuries. So a lot of people, once they sit with me for a while, they or look at my stuff, they even just looking at my YouTube stuff for free, you know, they start watching treasuries and they see that, it, that it's, a, for them, a, a better market to trade. How do you get only two digits on the ES? 
within the the settings you can just put I can't do it here but you can um, you can adjust your column size in jigsaw so you can change all these columns to whatever width that you would like you just use the, the mouse and you can click on the edge of it uh, what do you think of currencies I find them to be a little bit too li illiquid too um, it just depends on which ones, you know, but I don't trade them. What screen recorder do you use? It's Camtasia. Um, I'm in the Pacific in the morning, so the mornings are hard for me. Is there another bond market you'd recommend? No, if you're on Pacific time and you don't want to wake up at uh, 5.30 or 5 a.m., basically just wake up when you can and, you know, try to come in maybe by at least 9.30 Eastern and trade some of the action in the first two hours. But admittedly, it is harder for people that aren't in the central or eastern time zone. How can we set up our jigsaw to appear like yours? Um, that's some of that's on my site. I just send me an email. I'm not filtering. I'm just trying to go through because some of them, like someone asked my filtering questions. I am filtering questions because some of them are questions like, well, would you take a trade? Um, at, is, do you prefer fades or breakouts or this? And like that goes beyond what I'm trying to convey here today. Um, so I don't, I don't really have, we'd be here for three hours if I was answering every single question on, on these topics. If you have any questions about my the way that I trade or or what I do or the webinars, I would ask that you send me an uh, email, and I'm all I always respond, always, and I can get back to you on that. Same thing with setups or whatever. What are the critical news releases for Treasuries? Um, the ones at eight thirty usually. The the you know, the big ones, GDP and CPI and durable goods, retail sales, employment situations. Uh, do you use a jigsaw chart function along with the order book? I don't. I find that um, I just prefer to trade the DOM, but most people don't know this if you're new. The reason is because this is how I started. And when I traded in a prop firm, we were given the depth of market to watch, and that was pretty much it. And so once you look at that for years, you just tend to focus on that and really nothing else. I mean, I have ideas of levels and whatnot, but um, mostly I just look at the DOM. What's the maximum time you spend in front of your computer? It depends on the day. It's not based on a, a max time. It's just based on the activity. Again, responding to the moment as what you see. Um, what's the best way to start with order flow? The best way is to get the ladders up and running like this, like I have, and just watch them and try to get an, under, an understanding The other questions about typical win loss and the probabilities and all that, I would ask that you send me an email and here's why. What I always tell people is that for one thing, I don't sell a system. So I'm not selling something that says buy green, sell red. Okay. Um, the next thing is that I try to explain to people that what I showed you today is a way for you to use your own brain to improve your own results. 
All right. And I don't, I don't mean to be that like, I'm not coming across as, as, um, as flippant, hopefully, or, um, harsh or whatever. That's not my intention, but I always get these questions in these presentations. So what I try to explain to people is that if you are attempting to be a day trader, then you need to understand the order book. All right. And if you don't understand the order book and how it works and limit and market orders and the idea behind stops being triggered um, and momentum versus dead action and all this stuff that I talk about, then your odds of success are very, very, very low. All right. So do I claim to have all the answers? No, I don't claim to have all the answers. Do I claim that you can do it right away? No, I do not. It takes some time, it takes some work, it takes some effort, and you have to build the skill set the same way you would build the skill set um, playing chess or backgammon or poker or, or anything else. And so like the reason I'm talking about this and we'll wrap it up is because I'll give you a perfect example. You might see a guy that won a poker tournament, let's say, and now you want to sit down with that guy to play poker and you sit down in the game and the guy is losing in the game and you're sitting there and you're looking at the guy and you say, why are you losing? You're supposed to be a poker champion. I thought you won this tournament. And the guy's like, because the action sucks in this game. And if you're a new person, new to trading and you've never played poker or you're very, you have very limited experience with it. That doesn't make any sense to you. You might believe that a guy who's a professional poker champion should always be able to win in every single game that he plays. And if you watch those games, you'll see that that's not the case. Sometimes for them, I mean, cards can fall the wrong way and you don't have that same situation in, in trading, but sometimes the act, action is just bad. And so even if you catch cards, you can't make money because no one pays you off, right? Um, a guy that might be a good chess player, but not a great chess player sits down and he tries to show you some moves and you constantly question, well, how do you know that? I mean, you're not a grandmaster. I don't see you playing Kasparov or Deep Blue, you know? And the response is maybe not, but the guy probably knows more than you do. And so he's trying to maybe teach you opening strategy in chess and help you learn some things to help yourself, right? Improve your own results. And that's what I do. And that's why I try to help people. And yeah, I trade and I show trades and I show them live when I'm conducting webinars. Um, and I explain everything behind them. And, you know, I have testimonials that talk about it and they're all honest. Um, and if you have questions about that, please feel free to check out testimonials page and send me emails and all that good stuff. But for what it's worth, that's my response to all of that. And so definitely always email me or send me a Skype um, if you have additional questions on that. Are there any markets that are tradable for people who work a nine to five on the East Coast? It's really hard to find those, all right? Um, it, because it, you're your body won't acclimate well anyway. Even if you try to trade like overnight Asian markets, you'll be firing when you're very tired and not focused. So my recommendation for people who trade like who work nine to five is actually subscribe to a market replay service of some kind. And that will show you the activity throughout the day, how it unfolded. Uh, <clears throat> and then on the weekends or in the evenings, you can you know just come home and boot up your market replay and scan through the day. And you might not be able to watch the whole day or watch two hours of it, but you can at least fast forward through it, get a feel for the ebb and flow of the day. And then over time, you'll start to see how days differentiate from one another in terms of price action. Um, that's what I recommend. If you try to trade like overnight Asian markets, you're probably just gonna be hammered. You know, The next day you won't be, in terms of physically, you'll be so tired and, and restless and not focused. Um, what about European bonds? Yeah, the bond bobble and the Eurostox 50. I mean, those are all legitimate. If you live in Europe, certainly you can look at the Eurex products. Um, actually, if you live in Europe, you're pretty good because you can trade Eurex products during your morning time frame and you can trade the US open during your afternoon time frame. Some people do that. Here's a question on that last um, that last sample. Why would a market maker see if I can back this up? Uh, 
why would a market maker put a thousand at 4250 in the situation? Because it's not a market maker working a thousand at 4250. That's a hedge trade. <laughs> so what probably what most likely that is um, is somebody who's long a basket of stocks in the S and P, and they're getting hammered because the stock market's having a meltdown. And so they offer out at a certain price to hedge themselves to get short in the S&P. So like a big hedge fund might be, its risk might be way, way off from where it needs to be for their projections. And they want to hedge themselves and they throw out an offer of 800 or 1,000 or 1,200 contracts, um, try to get the fill, and then it's just a hedge. You know, it's basically balancing out the fact that they're getting worked on their long stock positions. Do you think anybody can manage to be profitable with enough time and effort? You can. I mean, that's a that's kind of a loaded question, right? I, you don't have to have formal education. And you don't have to be a genius because it's not rocket science, but you do have to understand the game and you have to understand it at all of its levels and you have to put in the time and discipline to learn it and to develop your own method and figure out where your strengths and weaknesses are. And then if you have the discipline to adhere to that, you have a shot. So most people fail because they don't understand the game. So they don't understand the order book or why the markets even move in the first place. They don't even know what limit orders are half the time. You'd be a still amazed at how many people don't understand market limit orders, but they're out there, you know, making trades. Um, and secondly, they don't have the discipline often to adhere to their strategy, even if they find one. So they might, they might find something using all these techniques I'm teaching. Hey, identify, classify, review, where are you solid? And they find out that they're best at, you know, fade trades against the trend. And then they start trying to play during news releases and they give away all their money. And that's more of a psychological thing. That's like the poker players who grind it out at the poker table and then walk over and bet it all on craps, you know, one roll of the dice. Um, so you have to have both to be successful. Uh, it's about ready to wrap it up. Let's see. Um, are your preferred market conditions? Let's say, is it fair to say that you don't engage when the pace of the trade has gone below average readings? It depends. Like the one treasury trade that it took an hour to make five ticks. I was engaged there because I, the context seemed to fit what I like to see. Um, but in general, I do prefer the activity to be a little faster. Yes, because when it's fa it, what the difference is, is when it's faster, it means more people are playing. So think of this analogy again, and I often use poker because it's so similar. If you're playing in a game where everybody's folding every hand, you know, and it just keeps going around and round and round and nobody's putting money into the pot, and the game is not a good game. And that's what's happening when the market's slow. When the market's fast, it's like, four or five guys are constantly putting money into the pot in the poker game. And so there's action, which means there's, there's activity and people want to play and that's where you get opportunities to make money. So typically when it's a little bit busier and there's movement, you're going to have the volatility and when it's not, you're not, and it becomes harder to read. Uh, why don't you watch the columns that show how many bids and offers are being pulled? Because I can keep track of that in my head for the most part, particularly in the treasuries. That's because the snapshot columns didn't exist when I started. I had to learn how to remember to do that. Um, they are useful for a lot of people who are just learning. That's the only reason. What about the DAX? It's pretty thin. Yeah, most people get killed in the DAX, um, but you should watch it when you're watching the Euro stocks if you are going to trade European stock markets. Um, so in other words, if you stay away from low volume, that's what I'm getting away getting from your style of trading. Yeah, very low volume when it's either low volume or very erratic volume. 
So if it's, you know, you sit there for 30 minutes and the market barely trades, that's not good. <clears throat> or you sit there and it goes back and forth, but it's just so erratic that you can't make a call, you know, that's pretty bad too. You care about economic fundamentals such as yield curves, sh short term versus long term. Ultimately, I care about them in terms of how likely they are to influence activity and whether or not we're likely to see movement, you know, this week, next week, the next month or whatever. Um, but on a moment to moment read, no, I don't. Not really. I mean, if there's a big technical level, like the 3% level or something in the 10 year, then yeah. But really, it's, it's more just sort of day to day. How long before the major news do you stop trading? Um, usually 10 minutes. So 8.20 Eastern, I'll definitely usually be out. Can you use Jigsaw with NinjaTrader Market Replay? I believe. Does Market Replay work through Ninja? Uh, yes, 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 you can. Yes. yes, you can. So that's a good way to go about it. Mm -hmm. um, why do you say oil is thin? It's thinner than most markets. I know there can be times when there's three, four hundred up. Um, it's just a different market altogether. Again, that's something like feel free to write me if you want to talk more about that. Um, what percentage end up making money after taking your courses or how long does it take people to become profitable? First off, that's not like the percentage wise, I wouldn't be able to answer publicly like this anyway. Um, some people do. I can tell you that. Some people don't. I can tell you that. How long does it take? It typically takes people, no matter whether they take my course or not, or anybody's course, if you're sitting down studying the depth of market and you're trying to learn your markets really well, it takes most people at least six to eight months, at least. Um, some people can turn the corner sooner than that. They're the, the exception, not the rule. Uh, some people are later. Some people are a year and a half, you know, but this, the thing about this, like when I get those questions, it's, it, most people when they start studying, whether they be trading or real estate, right, or, you know, government auctions or whatever it is that would be classified as, as, trade, as working for yourself um, and making money, they, they view it because they want money now. And this is why so many people go in and they trade one lots in gold because they don't have much money and they want to trade a one lot and they want to make $5,000 on a one lot and be able to pay off their credit card debt, right? And you cannot approach trading that way or real estate or anything else. You know, you have to understand that it's a skill set and it takes time to build that skill set like it does with anything. And so what I guess I would like everyone to remember who, who sort of thinks that way or who has this, these similar questions because there've been a few of them today. Um, a guy will spend eight plus years in school to become a doctor and then do a five year residency, 13 years of his life to building a skill set to make, in theory, what's going to be quite a bit of money doing what he does. And the same guy, once he makes money, will then take a hundred grand and wager it on a stock bet without knowing anything at all about the markets. That's the human condition. Everybody wants fast, easy money, and they don't want to work for it. Even guys who have worked decades of their life to get where they are, for some reason, can fall prey to the idea that they know something about an entirely different industry when they do not. You know what I mean? So I am the first to tell you, if you're really going to pursue day trading as a living, and Fernando can attest to this because he's been around it long enough, uh, and, and Peter as well, and, and various other people. You, got, you have to be willing to commit at least a year of your life to building the skill set. And you might figure it out prior to that. Um, you might be very good at games and game theory, and you might get it very quickly. Or you might need some time. Um, a lot of people dismiss ideas, too. Like they go through material, and they just constantly, they dismiss 60, 70% of it. And then a year later, they come back to me, and they say, you know that thing that I dismissed a year ago? I realize how important it is now. But, you know, it's everybody in their own time. So it is a very, um, 
demanding business and it requires a lot of focus and you do have to build a skill set. But the flip side to that is if you spend your time building the skill set and work for yourself and do pretty well financially and you're not beholden to anybody else. So you just have to ask yourself whether or not you're willing to spend the time and the effort to try to achieve that goal. All right. Uh, a couple more and we'll call it. Um, does uh, replay work with Tradevate? Yes, it does. Tradevate also has a market replay uh, service. What do footprint charts provide that Jigsaw doesn't? I mean, I don't I don't like footprints personally. I think they take up too much screen space and they sort of detract, they don't detract, they, they um, distract you from what's going on in the moment sometimes. But that's just me. Some people like footprints. Um, would you say that age has a limit on trading results? Not necessarily. Let me tell you why. I mean, sometimes people can be set in their ways. And so, yeah, in that situation, it can be difficult or sometimes a person might be looking for like supplemental income and not realize how difficult this is. But I've actually taught some people in their fifties and sixties who have gone on to do very well. So it's not, I would say that in general, of course, you know, kids between 18 and 27 are gung ho, but that's because they're poor and hungry and really, you know, ambitious. Uh, but as far as like the skill set required, you can, be older and still learn how to do this. Um, does the efficiency in this type of trading tend to worsen with age then? I mean, it that's also somewhat personal. Like there are guys who are actually better in, in their 40s and 50s than they were in their 20s, you know, like fund managers. So, because they, they know more about the market and the world. Uh, do you recommend trading with a one lot versus a demo? That's all personal as well. I mean, you're going to find that trading live is completely different than trading on a demo. Um, I have a blog on my site. If you got, if you want to read it, if you go to my blog post, um, the problems with sim trading, check that out. That discusses that. And, Let's stop here. Well, someone says they want to give me a plug. So is there anything in your ne next webinar different? I mean, the webinar that's coming up, if you are interested, I'd say just please write me, uh, contact me through my, my website. Um, it's a two-week-long web webinar. It's live. I log in in the mornings with everybody. We go over pre-market stuff, what to expect, news reports, levels, support resistance, um, and then I trade and I talk about it. And you can interact, you know, with Instant Messenger. We have Q&A. So yeah, I do run them. Obviously I run a business. I don't lie about that. Um, but it's proven to be helpful to many people. So if you have questions about it, please contact me. And then I would also say, um, if you found this interesting and you find the idea of recording and reviewing and classifying trades, interesting, uh, log on tomorrow with Peter and listen to what he has to say about journalytics. And I think you'll find that that's also a very helpful tool when it comes to trying to um, improve your results and, you know, fine tune your, your entries and exits and fine tune your methodology for the best results. All right. That's good. That's an hour and a half. All so, right, sir. Again, yeah, great presentation you. and great Q and A as usual. Thank you. Thank you all for attending and I will turn it back to you, Fernando. Okay. So I'd like to thank everybody to show up and listen. You know, great content, John provides always to us and tune in for tomorrow Peter's presentation and that's all for today. Thank you.